Hannika Smits is Global Head of Investment Management at BMY Mellon. Last year, she made the top 10 of American bankers' most powerful women in finance. She's also the global chair of the 30% Club, which aims to secure 30% representation of women on all major company boards globally. Her goal is to eradicate the need for the 30% Club entirely. And as a consequence, when my younger self entered the workplace, I just thought the sky was the limit. For me, there isn't a preferred model. It's sort of how you leverage the environment you are part of, right? How you use the capabilities of the enterprise to, to drive results. There's so much jeopardy as well involved in, in the figures and the sums of money that you're talking about. And I guess it becomes second nature to somebody in your position over a period of time. But that, that responsibility, does it, does it weigh quite heavily? Hanukkah, I wanted to start this pod by talking with you about your story and how you got to be the powerhouse that you are in the world of finance and, and your journey on the way to, to being that person. You're now the global head of investment management at BMY Mellon. And obviously, everyone's got their own path to tread. My daughter said to me the other day, well, mommy, I think I might want to be a banker when I'm older. And I thought that was a really extraordinary thing for a seven-year-old to say. But it's not necessarily the first childhood dream that somebody may have. Was it your dream? Was it your passion? How did, how did you come to be so interested in the world of finance? Yeah, it's very interesting uh, that, that you ask that question because I often reflect on it as well. And as I go around and talk to younger people, uh, my own daughter is 17 and I actually did a talk at her school uh, and started to think back to my own 17-year-old self and what I was thinking about. And my, my passion was actually for languages growing up. I grew up in the Netherlands. I did the equivalent of sort of the IB um, in eight subjects, and five of those were languages, Dutch, Latin, French, um, English, and German. And I wanted to pursue some kind of career that was going to combine languages, travel, and perhaps some, some work in the business world. But I ended up going down a different path, advised by my father, whose advice I did take uh, at age 17, and ended up going to a university that really set me up very well for life called Nairode in the Netherlands, which was modeled on a um, sort of American bachelor system. And it was a business degree that I took, but it also gave you exposure to languages. We had American professors as well as exchange students on, on campus. Um, it was quite global in its outlook. So to some degree, it satisfied my curiosity sort of for, for the world. Um, and then when I finished that, uh, it was only a three-year degree, uh, which for my generation was relatively short uh, in the Netherlands because most degrees lead up to a master's. So I decided to do um, some internships and some projects, somewhat trial and error, to figure actually out what I wanted to do uh, next. And I had the opportunity to do an internship with what we would now call a small venture firm in Hong Kong. And I went out there in early 1988. And I still remember landing at what was then Kai Tak Airport and the bustle and the energy and the scent. It was all so different, but also hugely energizing. And I found the work that I did there quite interesting, but also the, um, the fact that Hong Kong was already such a global hub. It really opened my mind to quite a wide range of possibilities that I then sort of since that I then continued to explore and pursue. As a woman stepping into that world, did you always feel like the doors were open and anything was possible? Um, I, you know, it's really interesting now looking back on this, this notion of as a woman, as you know, I'm passionate about diversity, I'm passionate about advancing women, and quite frankly, many other people from different backgrounds uh, in the workplace, because it's the diversity of thought that matters so much. But when I entered the world of work, I, I did not consider somehow that being female might be a disadvantage in, in, in financial services or, or, or quite frankly, in, in, in other areas. And perhaps that came from the confidence that my parents had instilled in me. Um, I came from a background where for, for, for both of my parents, education 
was really, really critical. Uh, I have a sister and a brother, and uh, my father used to say to us that the key thing I can help you focus on is ensure you you have a good education. You need to be, and you see in particular say to my sister and me, you need to be able to stand on your own feet and be financially independent. And when when I can see that you can do that, then sort of my job is done. And he didn't really differentiate um, between my sister and myself on the one hand in terms of what he wanted from us and or expected of us and, and, and my brother. So, so as such, I did not come into the workplace thinking that I would encounter a, a different type of environment than the one that I had grown up in. So to, to some extent, a very strong perspective that my parents delivered had really been passed down to them from my grandparents on both sides, my, on my father's side, um, they'd been born in the 1890s, had lived through two world wars, as well as the Great Depression, had lost their farm uh, during or had to give up farming uh, in the 1930s. And the thing that got my father's father back on track was the fact that he had a higher level type of agricultural education. And he ended up working for the Ministry of Agriculture in the Netherlands. He had six children. My father was the youngest. And so for my grandfather, it was really important that his three daughters and his, my aunts, as well as his three sons, uh, would be able to, to sustain themselves uh, financially. And on my mother's side, uh, they uh, were in Indonesia during the Second World War, uh, unfortunately spent some time in a prisoner of war camp, uh, lost my grandfather uh, towards the end of the war. And so my grandmother came back with my mother and my aunt um, and had to rebuild their lives back in the Netherlands. And again, there was a really strong focus on, on, on my mother's mother's part that her daughters had to have an education that allowed them to be independent. So it really came to me through the generations. And as a consequence, when my younger self entered to workplace, I just thought the sky was the limit. You talk so fondly about your parents and your grandparents. Do you, do you see your family as being the greatest influence on you? They, they were, yes, they were and have continued to be a huge uh, influence on me. I was very fortunate to have a very close family quite a large family as well, lots of lots of interesting people. But also my father was a businessman. He was actually the first uh, of his generation uh, to, or, or of his siblings to go to university and was a successful businessman in the Netherlands. So naturally, as I pursued that path, I would, uh, he was a great mentor and a good advisor. I would turn to him for advice when I was faced with some early, you know, with some choices uh, in in the or earlier part of my career, he passed away eight years ago. But there are still moments where I think, you know, when I when I'm at a fork in the road, what what would he have done? What what would he have said uh, around leadership and around choices uh, that you make? It's interesting you mentioned that fork in a road. I mean, has there been one in particular that's had greater significance than the others, which has determined what's happened subsequently in the path in which you've taken? So I would say there have been, um, when I look back over my career, it sort of had two quite big forks. I've spent time in private market, in the private markets world of investing between 1992 and 2000 and the end of 2014. And over that period, I really, I only worked for two organizations. And a real fork in the road for me was in 1997. Um, having been with one organization uh, where I had a fabulous opportunity to learn a lot and, and hone my skills as an analyst, I got a phone call from effectively a competitor, uh, uh, which ended up becoming Adam Street Partners, where I spent 17 years of my career, uh, to ask if I would set up their, I had an interest in being considered to set up their European uh, investment portfolio and team, uh, and, and subsequently also client base. Um, it did mean I had spent a year in Chicago and I thought about it long and hard uh, because I was very um, tied to uh, the company I had first worked for. They'd given me a great opportunity and I'd learned a lot there over, over the course of the first five years. 
But now you get to the fork in the road and how one thinks about risk and opportunity. Being offered the opportunity to start a portfolio from scratch, a team from scratch, on one hand, can be very, very scary. And you can only look at the risk, but you could also just look at the opportunity. And there, actually, talking to my father at the time, who was definitely more in the camp of seeing the opportunity, and I tend to be in that camp as well. You need to manage the risk around it and, and understand that there is risk with taking that decision. I went for the opportunity and sort of then never looked back. I was in Chicago for a year, came back to London, set up that European team, developed the track record, was then also asked uh, by my then US colleagues um, to uh, consider an Asian portfolio. So recruited that particular team who worked with me in London for some time. And then over time, we uh, broadened that out to a team in Singapore and Beijing. So I, I continue to have that global connectivity and perspective. Uh, I was able to actually uh, bring my curiosity into the workplace, which was wonderful. Um, but again, it's also about those forks in the road, how you think about the risk versus the opportunity. And then the next time came during 2014 when I'd been with that organization for, you know, about 17 years and started to think about what's next, how much, you know, I was in my late 40s, how much longer do I want to continue in this role? And I, I came to the conclusion, which which, you know, that uh, for a number of reasons, my heart wasn't completely in it anymore. Um, I had really enjoyed setting up Europe, Asia. I ended up um, being the global chief investment officer. So also working much more closely with my US colleagues, seen a lot, done a lot, but I felt I was ready for something else. I wasn't quite sure what. So I took the decision to uh, to leave, uh, which I did at the end of 14, and, and, and then I had a year off. And to be honest, when you sit at home uh, after you've made that decision, you just think, oh, my goodness, what have I done now? And then you need to start thinking about how you develop that, you know, that next chapter and where you take your skills and capabilities next. Yes, because I suspect even though you've taken that decision and you, you know, you've controlled that journey, there must be a period of vulnerability there where you are sat back for a moment thinking, actually, what does the next step really look like? And then you've got to dive in. So what is that period of time like for somebody who is used to being able to sort of seize the opportunity and, and move forward in that way when actually you are required to stand back and sort of assess your options? Well, first of all, I saw it as a as a as a period of great privilege to have the time to step back and assess what I wanted to do next. And I sort of spent time, you know, I sort of did three things. Uh, first of all, I listened. Uh, I went around and I spoke to a number of people I'd known for some time who were ahead in their who were ahead of me in terms of their career. And who'd gone through a sort of similar change to learn, from, you know, to, to better understand and learn from them how they approached going through such a change. Then secondly, I thought long and deep about the core skills and capabilities that I had developed, uh, which wasn't so much about, oh, I can run spreadsheets, but it was more around, you know, is it more about people leadership? Is it about investment leadership? And what, what of those skills are transferable to other types of, of organizations. And then I also thought long and hard around, um, you know, the work-life balance, um, how much I wanted to travel, what type of organization I wanted to be part of, big or small. And I was very fortunate when the opportunity with Newton came along in uh, early 2016, because it gave me um, the opportunity to move into a different part of the investment world where I could, where I felt that I could transfer some of my, but not all of my investment knowledge. And there was also an opportunity for me to learn uh, some new things, uh, which I think is always, is, is always key. And there was also an opportunity to work with colleagues at Newton to make it a bit more global and diversified away from um, its very, very strong foundations in the UK. But from a personal perspective, I also knew that Newton was of a scale where 
I didn't have to do that globalization all by myself, which was the case 20 years earlier when uh, when I had started at what had become Adam Street, when you literally build a team from scratch. So um, that was a very an, very interesting journey. And then being part of, a, you know, running a subsidiary of a much larger enterprise um, it was also interesting to come full circle. I've worked for very small organizations. I've worked for organizations that were part of a large bank that we then spun out and I've sort of come back the other way. And what I've learned from that when people ask me, is there, you know, do you have a preferred model? I would say there isn't, for me, there isn't a preferred model. It's sort of how you leverage the environment you are part of, right? How you use the capabilities of the enterprise to, to drive results uh, going forward. At the end of the day, we all work for our clients and shareholders, and the clients can be different, shareholders can be different, they can be private shareholders, they can be public shareholders, but that is ultimately what we do, irrespective of the size of the uh, organization you're in. And I'm also a believer that one can be entrepreneurial, and quite frankly, should be entrepreneurial, even when working in a large corporate. Well, that's very interesting. So how does that best manifest itself then if you if there's this sort of entrepreneurial approach and spirit, but there's so much jeopardy as well involved in, in the figures and the sums of money that you're talking about. And I guess it becomes second nature to somebody in your position over a period of time. But that, that responsibility, does it does it weigh quite heavily? And how do you balance the entrepreneurship with keeping things absolutely safe as houses? <laughs> Yeah, so, so of course, it's it's a huge responsibility, but of course, I also don't manage all of that myself. We have a series of fabulous teams and experts in asset classes through the subsidiaries that we own who directly manage the portfolios for the clients. I, I, I see it as my job to ensure that we have the right teams in place, the right leaders to deliver those uh, results to clients. And I also see it as my role uh, to think strategically on behalf of the organization and continue to look for areas of innovation, be it working more closely with the bank of, of, of BNY Mellon or, um, you know, delivering new solutions for our clients. And that is that is where you can sort of apply some of the entrepreneurship we're thinking because it does require some creativity. But a lot of it is also about the teams around you. So every time you step into a new role, I've always found you, you need to spend time with people and teams to to understand uh, to understand them, to um, ensure that you feel that you're supported by them, that they have the right areas of focus, and that you know that you have a clear understanding on both sides when your engagement and leadership is needed, and when you can let the teams, um, uh, r you know, run to meet their objectives. I think many people who are just embarking on their own businesses or their own startups perhaps or involved in small businesses will find the people piece a real challenge and getting that right a real challenge. So how do you go about making sure you've got not just the right skill set where people are required but also the right team? 